Meet Jonathan Byrd, one of the world's top underwater nature cinematographers. Traveling the world on assignment for all the major networks, he is an Emmy Award winning authority on the underwater world. In freshwater or salt, reefs, wrecks, or caves, Jonathan documents the world beneath the waves. Welcome to the Blue World. The tiger shark has a bad reputation. Not just for attacking swimmers and surfers, but also for eating just about anything. They have such a reputation for indiscriminate feeding that they're often called the garbage cans of the ocean. Sometimes, though, reputations are built upon myths and legends, not facts. To get to the bottom of this age-old stereotype, I've mounted an expedition to a famous place in the Bahamas called Tiger Beach, where tiger sharks have been fed by divers for many years, so the sharks are used to interacting with people. I'll be performing a tiger shark experiment with the help of expert shark handlers Rich Dargento and Connor Cassidy. Once the chum is in the water and the sharks have shown up, it's time to go diving and find some tiger sharks. Connor brings down a big crate of bait to get a large tiger shark to come close. Julia is with me as camera operator. I've left my big camera behind and instead brought a tiny GoPro on a pole. The GoPro is fun for underwater selfies, but that's not why I brought it. I want to see if a hungry tiger shark will try to eat a camera if I offer it. Worst case, I'm going to lose my GoPro. Best case, I might get a great shot inside a tiger shark's mouth. A monster tiger known to the dive masters as Roxy comes on the scene. She's very gentle as she munches down fish heads and swims around the divers. I offer her my camera as a snack. In spite of everything I've read about tiger sharks eating anything they can find, this shark has no interest in eating a GoPro. In fact, the only way I can get her to bite it is by putting it in her mouth when she's gulping down a piece of fish. And even then, she lets it go. Every single time I try, she spits it out. So much for tiger sharks eating anything that fits in their mouth. I'm not sure I believe all that hype about tiger sharks being the garbage cans of the ocean. I actually think tiger sharks are a lot smarter than they get credit for. And I'm going to prove it with Rich and Connor's help. Rich and Connor have invented a great new gadget, which will open up new creative possibilities. So, Rich, what is this thing? Well, this is actually our shark cam that clips onto the dorsal fin of the tiger shark. You clip it on the shark like so, and you get different angles of the shark. So you get all the head motion and all the cool swimming around it does and going around the reef, coming back to us. No harm to the shark. I mean, as you can see, clips on, very soft, you know, can fall off if need be. And mm -hmm. so if it does fall, it falls on the ground. Also keeps the right angle. Get the nice. Wow, so this is a highly uh, scientifically developed Absolutely, made with product. zip ties and. <laughs> is there a trick to putting it on the shark? 
There is, yeah. I mean, the shark's got to be coming in in the right spot at the right time. They can shake it off if they want to, so you got to keep an eye on it so we don't want to lose our camera. Right. Well, let's go try it out. Let's All right. Do it. All right. To deploy the shark cam, first we need a willing shark. Our team hits the water again. We gather around as Rich and Connor feed the big tiger sharks, looking for a cooperative animal. Roxy comes in close and presents a perfect opportunity to clip on the shark cam. I can clip it on my hand so it definitely doesn't hurt, but Roxy can feel it on her fin and she doesn't like it. She shakes it off. But we got the camera back so we can try again. Connor clips it a little lower, hoping it will stay on better. And off she goes, the first Blue World camera shark. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. After clipping the shark cam to Roxy's dorsal fin, we watch as she swims away with our camera. Now Roxy is shooting the footage. We couldn't ask for a better view, looking out over her head as she gently swims over the bottom. A nice big shark swims so smoothly. She does give it a shake, trying to make it pop off. But for the moment, at least, the camera stays on. I'm just hoping she doesn't swim too far and lose our camera. As if knowing exactly what we want, Roxy cruises off on a lap around the reef. Of course, we're back near the boat, wondering if we'll ever see our GoPro again. She begins to bank left, making a huge circle. She swings down a little deeper to get us some excellent shots of the beautiful seagrass bed, a habitat so important to fish, invertebrates, and sea turtles. Next, she glides over the sand at 40 feet, showing rows of ripples created by currents and waves. She's cruising just above the sand. In the distance, the reef where she began her lap. This shark knows exactly what she's doing. She's coming right back to our group. As she comes over the top of the reef, nobody sees her yet. But then you can hear cheering as we spot her coming into view. Just as she reaches the bait box for another snack, she shakes the camera off right at our feet, as if she planned it that way. If you think sharks aren't smart, you're wrong. Roxy knows exactly what she's doing. Who needs a cameraman when you have a camera shark? Roxy the shark has shown me that it's possible we misunderstand tiger sharks. They are smarter than they look. They don't go around the ocean eating license plates and GoPros. 
In fact, in my admittedly limited experience, a tiger shark is more likely to shoot some great video than it is to eat the video camera. Florida has a well-deserved reputation for sun, sand, and ocean. But North Florida is known in the scuba diving community as a top cave diving destination, cave country. Most North American cave divers get their training here in Florida. Once they're certified, they go out and explore caves in other parts of the world like Mexico and the Bahamas. But I did it backwards. I did my training in the Bahamas and I've never explored Florida caves. Until today. This is Jug Hole at Ikatuckney Springs State Park. Above water, it just looks like a little pond. But underwater, nestled within a ring of eelgrass, there's a hole going straight down into the earth. In this part of Florida, the soil is thin over a base of limestone created by ancient coral reefs. But over millions of years, rainwater has eaten away at the limestone, creating a kind of Swiss cheese called karst. It's full of caves, which are full of water. In places, the water flows out of the ground in springs that form surface rivers and streams. That's exactly what Jug Hole is, a spring. I begin my day at Amigos Dive Center in Fort White with owner Wayne Kennard, my guide to diving North Florida. Wayne's shop is smack dab in the middle of Florida cave country. We load tanks and gear and hit the road for a short drive to an amazing place. Soon we arrive at Ikatuckney Springs State Park, which has no less than seven springs that together feed the Ikatuckney River. short walk, lugging gear in a cart, we reach Blue Hole Spring, known to the locals as Jug Hole, one of the largest of the springs. It flows at between 40 and 60 million gallons a day, which is enough to fill two swimming pools every minute. We suit up with side mount cave diving gear and prepare to explore Jug Hole. And as soon as we're ready, Todd's camera malfunctions. After I sealed it and everything was working then. Underwater cameras are notoriously finicky and they always pick inconvenient moments to act up. With the camera sorted out, we head underwater. Wayne is leading the way. Water is gushing out of the spring. It blows us back with such force that we need to fight to get down into the entrance of the cave. Once through the narrow opening, we enter a large cavern zone that opens up like a jug inside, which is where the spring gets its name. At the bottom of the jug, 
the cave leads down at an angle. Wayne ties a guideline and leads the way. I follow behind with my big camera, fighting just to make forward progress against the strong current. Most well-visited caves like this one have a warning sign to remind divers who aren't cave trained to stay out. I push past the warning sign, leaving the cavern zone where you can still see light from the opening. Soon we arrive at a wide but very low section of cave. It barely looks like anyone can fit in there, but Wayne squeezes right in. As I push in behind him, I realize that my camera is almost too large to fit. This wide but low section of cave is called the bedding plane. There was a layer of softer rock in this space, but it was dissolved away by the water, leaving the harder rock on the ceiling and floor. The current through here is very strong. Cameraman Todd and I have to claw our way forward. It's not a place for the claustrophobic, and it's also not an easy place to work a camera. On the far side of the bedding plane, we come out into a larger chamber, and since there's more space, the current is lower. In many caves, the sandy bottom in this chamber would be a big hazard, but in this cave, any silt we kick up is carried away immediately. At the far end of the big chamber, just as I'm getting used to the gentle current, we reach a tiny restriction. This cave is famous for this restriction. If you can't get through, this is as far as you go. Wayne shows me the right body angle and goes first to demonstrate. Most back mount divers have to take their scuba tanks off to get through here. But with side mount, we can just barely make it. Again, my camera is so big that I'm more concerned about banging it on the rocks than I am about getting through the restriction. The current through this tiny restriction is so powerful that I have to pull myself through. My fins are useless. As we work our way further into the cave, we're now about 100 feet deep and 400 feet from the entrance. The passages are getting smaller. I find a bone on the cave floor, most likely dating back to a time during the last ice age, perhaps 15,000 years ago, when the cave was dry and animals could walk in. Wayne takes a turn to show me something in a side passage. It's a chimney that goes straight up but it doesn't lead to the surface. 
It's a potentially deadly trap to a lost diver who leaves the line. Soon we reach the end of the line, literally 550 feet from the entrance, as far as divers can fit. We go around a corner into a section of the cave with no flow. In here the water is stagnant and murky. Time to turn around and head back out. Having turned around at the end of the line, our team is making its way back to the light of day. But things are a little different on the way out. Now we're going with the current. You might think that makes it easier, since we don't have to fight the current. But now we have two different problems. First, the current is trying to throw us into the rocks and push us through restrictions from behind. Second, if we kick up any silt, it travels downstream with us. When we get back to the restriction, Todd and Wayne head through first. I squeeze through with the water pushing me hard from behind. Back at the bedding plane, we stop for some pictures with underwater photographer Gene Page. Finally, we head back out into the cavern zone to decompress. While I'm decompressing, I have time to think about this dive and compare it to other caves I've visited. In the Bahamas and the Yucatan, the caves tend to have a lot of fragile formations, almost no current, and salt water under the fresh water. The caves in Florida tend to be all fresh water, often with strong water flow and very little in the way of ornamentation. It's a different kind of cave diving. You don't have to be as concerned about breaking fragile formations, but you do have to fight the current. No matter what kind of caves I'm diving into, cave diving is an exhilarating sport that satisfies my urge to explore the unknown. And with the caves of Florida so close and convenient, I'll definitely be back to Wayne's shop for more cave diving soon. This time on Blue World, Jonathan heads to the Bahamas to learn cave diving from a world-renowned cave explorer. Meet Jonathan Berg, one of the world's top underwater nature cinematographers. Traveling the world on assignment for all the major networks, he is an Emmy Award-winning authority on the underwater world in freshwater or salt, reefs, wrecks, or caves. Jonathan documents the world beneath the waves. Welcome to the Blue World. I'm deep in a cave, blindfolded, being spun around to intentionally make me disoriented. I'm completely lost. And now, I have to find my way out of the cave all by myself, blind. I start off by tying a guideline to a rock by feel alone. 
Then I grope around in the dark for a while, trying to find the main line out of the cave. Eventually, I do find the line, and I tie in. Then I follow that line towards the cave entrance. You might be wondering, what am I doing? In the past few years, I've become really interested in cave diving, so I thought it was time to finally advance my dive training to a full cave certification. Full cave certification is kind of like the black belt of scuba diving. It's not easy. The training is intense, designed to test your nerves and your confidence. It has to be, because underwater caves are extremely dangerous. If you get lost and run out of air, you will die. The training is designed to teach divers not to panic, not to get lost, and never to run out of air. So obviously, choosing the right instructor is important. That's why I contacted Brian K. Cook, one of the world's most famous and respected cave explorers, known for his impressive discoveries and passionate efforts to protect some of the world's most fragile and vulnerable caves. Caves are his passion, but Brian also spent years as a dive safety officer working on big Hollywood film productions like the Pirates of the Caribbean movies and many others. Brian agreed to accept me as a student, but he wouldn't go easy on me because I'm a TV guy. In fact, photographers often do the most damage to caves with big, cumbersome cameras, so I will have to work extra hard to earn his approval. Brian is based out of Abaco, an island in the Bahamas known in the cave diving community as the home of the most exquisitely decorated caves in the world. So my training begins with a flight to the Bahamas, and I have no idea what I'm in for. Brian picks me up in his scuba van, and it's off to his shop to show me how to get some of my new cave diving gear set up. The hardest thing for me will be my new side mount gear. Side mount diving is something completely new to me. Uh, it's a lot easier to do it with, uh, with the cam band than it is with a right. with stainless band. Cameraman Todd is already cave certified, but side mount diving is new to him as well, so Brian also helps set up his gear. We want this to end up in the thorax right here. Cave divers need to wear two scuba tanks. Side mount is a style of diving where the diver wears the scuba tanks on the sides instead of the back. Not only is it a lot more comfortable than wearing both scuba tanks on your back, but it creates a lower profile, so you can fit through small restrictions. Because the caves in Abaco are filled with restrictions and delicate formations, a lower profile means less damage to the cave and more places you can go. But before I can start diving, there's a lecture. You're never too old to go back to school and learn something new. My progression from open water diver to full cave diver will take at least nine long 12-hour days of instruction in both the classroom and the water. Otis has heard this one a million times. We talk a little bit about signaling. Diver one, instead of having to turn around and ask everybody, are you okay? He'll shine his light up here and say, hey, are you guys okay? Big circle on the wall where everybody can see it. Because using a guideline is a critical skill, we head out into the parking lot for some dry practice. If you don't check your buoyancy first, you're going to be doing this, pushing off, pushing off, trying to get this undone, and you're going to keep falling down or floating up. So the first thing you do when you find a tie-off is you come up to it, hover, neutrally buoyant. Now I can reach back, unclip this, and bring it forward. All right, so buoyancy first, always. Buoyancy will become a common theme in my class. Cave divers must exhibit near-perfect buoyancy, not only to keep from breaking the formations in the cave, but to keep from kicking up silt. First, Brian runs a guideline around an imaginary cave. What you're going to do is first stop, buoyancy. Then it's time for me to learn some guideline techniques. One, two. Yeah, just like that. And then I'm going to do... One, two. There you go. But I'm not just learning how to run a guideline. 
I also have to learn how to use it in an emergency, such as in the pitch darkness. So I have to practice with my eyes closed. Go ahead and start doing that. You really want to keep your head down. Right, and so you want that hand to be the highest point. You don't want to be whacking it. Exactly right. Back in the shop, we make a few last minute gear adjustments. Then it's finally time to head over to Dan's cave for some in water skills. We load up Brian's big van full of gear. Then it's off to the cave. Dan's cave is located about 35 minutes south of Brian's shop. We drive a while and then turn off down an old logging road we travel into the middle of a huge pine forest. Finally, we arrive at a small clearing. Brian keeps the place tidy, the grass mowed, and has even built some small structures to hang the gear. For the ultimate in luxury, he sets up an awning to give us a little shade from the hot Bahamian sun as we put our gear together. After years of anticipation, I get my first glimpse of the cave where I will be doing 90% of my training, Dan's Cave. It's beautiful and peaceful and small. It's hard to imagine that this tiny opening leads to miles of caves that Brian has explored and mapped. This little oasis attracts life. Birds are chirping, hundreds of butterflies flit about, and a curly-tailed lizard watches us intently. To a chorus of frogs, we carry our tanks down to the water. With side mount, you don your tanks in the water, so we carry them down to the cave entrance and place them for later. Preparing for our dive into Dan's cave, Brian and I are suiting up for a dive that should last at least two hours. Since the water is only around 75 degrees Fahrenheit, a wetsuit is necessary to keep warm. Then I don my side mount harness, which is kind of like the buoyancy compensator I normally use, but there's no tank strapped on the back. In the water, I clip my tanks to my harness, run my hoses, check my gas, test my regulators and inflator valve, and test my lights. Helmets provide a convenient place to mount a backup light or two and provide some protection from an accidental contact with the cave ceiling. When I'm ready, Brian and I do a very careful check of each other. In cave diving, small equipment issues can quickly turn into big problems, so catching anything small now is important. Were we good to go? Yes, we're good to go. Okay. Finally, we're ready to submerge, and I have to practice tying off our reel in what is called the primary tie-off. Then we descend down into the cavern. I continue to make tie-offs where Brian tells me to. He's having me practice on all kinds of different shapes. Finally, we make the final tie-off, called a terminal tie-off, right next to the stop sign. The stop sign signifies the end of the cavern zone, the part of the cave where you can still see light from the opening. I can't go past this sign at this stage of my training. The first exercise I have to perform is a simulation of a blind navigation in an out-of-air situation. I'm breathing from Brian's long hose regulator while following the guideline with my eyes shut, and he's using me as his guide by holding my arm. Then we switch positions and he's the one out of air. Normally this would be done with our lights off in the dark, but we need light for Todd to film it, so I have to promise to keep my eyes shut. We navigate all the way back to the entrance. Doing it with my eyes closed builds confidence in the guideline system, and it's my job to practice retrieving the line by spooling it back up.
Getting out of the water is the opposite of getting in. You take your tanks off before you climb out. We drag our gear out of the water and haul it back up to the truck. Cave diving is a lot of work, but at least you never get seasick. Soon we take apart our portable base camp and head back to Brian's shop. As the sun sets over Marsh Harbor, I can rest a little, but that was only day one. I have another eight days of training still to go. Every morning my training starts the same way. Bright and early, I'm back in the classroom trying to remember a lot of new terms, definitions, rules, and tips as Brian works his way through from the basics to the more advanced concepts. And after the classroom session, we analyze our tanks and load the van. Finally, we're on our way again. At the cave site, Brian has another exercise for me finding a lost guideline in the dark. I have to promise to keep my eyes shut again as Brian spins me around so I don't know where the line is. If I cheat, I'm only cheating myself because I won't learn how this is done. The first step is to tie off to something so I can find where I started. Keep in mind, my eyes are shut. I have to do this by feel alone. No, I was watching, you were All right. Then I pick a direction, That's moving cheating. slowly while sweeping my arm up and down to try to catch the guideline that will lead me to safety. In my first attempt, I'm going the wrong way. Well, I feel like I might have gone too far. Since I've gone far enough that I should have found the line by then, I go back to the starting point by reeling myself back in. Then, using my hands and the position of the line I tied, I pick a new direction. Success! I find the guideline and tie my reel in. Now I have to figure out which way is out. Okay, so this is tied in now. Line arrows on the guideline always point the way out of the cave. I don't know which way is out in this particular case because you just made it up. Yeah, so it. I guess I'll just go this way and I know I'm going to find out. Radar, radar, radar. Use your... Use your... I feel along until I feel a line arrow and figure out which way it's pointing. Yep. <laughs> Going the wrong way. All right, the way out is this way. Awesome. I swear I did not cheat. I had my <laughs> eyes shut. Somehow I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm going to have to do that again. Underwater. With the lost line drill over with, it's time to start putting together our gear for the dives. Once again, we huff our gear to the cave. Entering the cave for my third day of training, I finally get to go past the stop sign. I'm now past the cavern part of the training. It's real cave time. Brian has me lead for a while, and just when I'm thinking this is going to be an easy dive, he springs another blind out-of-air drill on me. My training dives are not all blind exercises, though. Throughout the course, as I progress from intro to cave diver to apprentice cave diver and finally full cave diver, Brian takes me and Todd to see the sights, practice our side mount skills, and sometimes snake our way through the Swiss cheese limestone. Everywhere I look, Dan's cave is full of wonders. Moving through crystal clear water, we pass innumerable extremely fragile formations that took thousands of years to form.
In one room, a massive column 30 feet tall and ornamented like a huge candle of dripping wax, but made of solid stone deposited over thousands of years. Dan's cave is a treasure trove of formations the likes of which I've never seen. On one ceiling, the stalactites are short and knobby. Not far away, they're long and smooth like icicles, formed of the purest white crystal. In a large room, some 700 feet from the entrance, a formation Brian calls Aristotle's head. Further in, we enter a forest of tall, slender columns. Ever so gently, Todd and I follow Brian through. If I ever broke one of these ancient, beautiful formations, I would never forgive myself. We move gently and carefully with absolute buoyancy control. Brian has me navigate us into another room where he shows me magnificent drapery formations. Made of stone deposited by dripping water, this formation is so thin that Brian can easily shine his light through it. It's as fragile as glass. We head deeper into the cave. We squeeze through a low section that would not appeal to anyone with claustrophobia, but Brian wants to show me something magnificent. Under a crystal crust, a layer of red dust tinted by iron ore, something not found naturally in the Bahamas. Experts think this is Sahara desert dust brought here on the wind thousands of years ago and washed into the caves by rain. Even though we aren't doing drills on this dive, part of cave diving is just learning to be comfortable in a confined and fragile environment while managing a lot of gear and maintaining proper buoyancy. In short, sightseeing is good practice. Exploring Dan's cave has been amazing, but soon we reach our thirds. One third of our air supply is gone. It's time to turn around and head back. On the way out, Brian spots a remipede, a type of rare blind crustacean that only lives in caves. With its two large antennae, this little guy is called the hammerhead remipede. We also find a blind Bahamian cavefish, the super predator in the cave, only a few inches long. We pass the stop sign back into the cavern zone, and I can see the light above from the opening. We do a safety stop at 15 feet for three minutes, just as we would in open water, to be sure nobody has any decompression sickness issues. And then it's back to the light of day. We had to do more lights out drill where he has to follow the line by feel. And then we kind of stepped up the difficulty by having an out of air situation at the same time. 
And then we stepped that up to having to go through a tiny little hole, single file, with zero lights and also um, uh, sharing air, too. Honestly, it was fun. But, you know, I know that I'm with the guy who knows the way out, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm not too worried. And you did all the navigation coming out on your own, right? We made it back to the sun. You didn't make any wrong turns. <laughs> On the last day of my training, I have to take the final. It's not just a multiple choice exam, but in fact has mostly essay questions. It's been a while since I've taken an exam, and this one takes three hours. Just to make it even more nerve wracking, Brian reads and grades it while I watch. But fortunately, he likes it and. I pass. I get my cave diving certification card. Cave diving isn't for everyone. It requires a lot of training to be safe and a tolerance for claustrophobia. But for the people who choose to venture into these remote underground worlds, the rewards are immense. My new cave training has opened my eyes to new diving techniques and paved the way for many more future adventures. You might just be seeing a few more cave stories here in the Blue World. This time on Blue World, Jonathan visits a submerged Mayan burial ground. Meet Jonathan Bird one of the world's top underwater nature cinematographers. Traveling the world on assignment for all the major networks, he is an Emmy Award winning authority on the underwater world. In freshwater or salt, reefs, wrecks or caves, Jonathan documents the world beneath the waves. Welcome to the Blue World. Sixty-six million years ago, an enormous asteroid tumbled through space. Traveling ten times the speed of a rifle bullet, this celestial missile was on a direct collision course with Earth. It smashed into Earth with such force that it triggered earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The impact threw a cloud of dust into the atmosphere, cooling the planet and killing the dinosaurs. The impact crater is located just north of the Yucatan Peninsula in what is now Mexico. Around the outer ring of the crater, cracks formed in the limestone, allowing groundwater to flow through, eroding into caves. When a cave ceiling gets too thin and falls in, you get what is known as a cenote. The word cenote was derived from the Mayan word meaning sacred well, a source of water. Fast forward to 2,000 years ago, the Maya civilization dominated Central America. They built their cities near the cenotes so they had access to fresh water from what are essentially super clean underground rivers. Thanks to that asteroid, there are more cenotes in this area than any place else in the world, thousands of them running along the rim of the ancient crater. It's an incredible place for some underwater exploration. To begin our adventure, cameraman Todd and I fly down to Merida, Mexico, a city surrounded by thousands of mostly unexplored cenotes. Our first stop, Freedom Divers, where I meet owner Jeff Shaw, my host for underwater exploration. Jeff? Jonathan. Hey, hey. Nice to meet you. Man. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Merida. Thanks. Ready to do some diving? Let's go hit some cenotes. All right, let's go. All right. We pile all our gear into Jeff's pickup truck and drive south. We stop along the way to pick up his friend Aaron Diaz, a local cave diving expert, and a few of his local guides, Elmer, Felipe, and Carlos. We drive out into the bush, and the road slowly turns into barely more than a path. Eventually, the guides get out and use machetes to clear the brush for the truck. At 
At last, we reach Cenote Sha'an, and the guides start setting up. Looking inside the Cenote, I can tell you this. I would not want to fall in there by accident. The surface of the water is 15 meters down, and the only way out would be climbing a tree root. <laughs> this is going to be an adventure. Elmer, Felipe, and Carlos are rigging some ropes so that we can rappel down to the water. Meanwhile, the dive team is getting ready. This is a full cave dive with all the gear that requires, plus something extra. This is one of the unique pieces of gear we're using today, something you don't normally see scuba diving a climbing harness. Ready to go. Woo. With the ropes all set up, it's time for our team to rappel down into the cenote. Jeff goes first to demonstrate. Next, it's my turn. While I have never started a dive with a rappel, I did learn to rappel in high school, so it's all good fun. The trees that we're rappelling down are actually roots. They don't go down into the bottom. Once they reach the water, they stop with a gap underneath that makes them look like something out of a sci-fi movie. It takes a while to get everyone and their gear down into the water. The divers can rappel, but all the tanks and cameras have to be lowered carefully to us. Elmer, Felipe, and Carlos are working hard. At last, with all of our gear, we can follow the beams of sunlight down into the cenote. In the middle of the cenote is a debris pile principally made of the rock that fell when the ceiling collapsed, opening this cave to sunlight. But towards the edges of the cenote, it gets deeper. Aron leads the way to a permanent guideline into the cave. Soon we have passed into the cave, out of sight of sunlight. We swim into a massive chamber, larger than a basketball court. The water is crystal clear. At the back of the chamber, a passageway leads into the wall. As I approach, Aron suggests I go first to get some great shots without anyone kicking up the silt. I slowly head inside, not sure what to expect. This is what I love about cave diving. So much adventure exploring the unknown. And there is something cool about swimming through a crack in the rock. I lead the way into a gorgeous passageway that almost looks like a miniature riverbed with pebbles paving the floor. The white limestone walls reflect my video lights making beautiful illumination. In a few minutes, we reach an intersection, and I'm not sure which way to go, so I stop and wait for Jeff and Aaron. As we continue down the limestone tunnel, we eventually emerge into a huge room. 
I stop for a shot, and then Jeff leads the way into the room, following a permanent guideline. The patterns on the walls are sculpted by hundreds of thousands of years of erosion as the water has slowly dissolved the stone. The patterns actually remind me of the way that ocean water dissolves the ice of an iceberg. Striations in the walls show where the water levels were in the past during ice ages when the sea levels were lower, so the groundwater was lower too. In the past, this cenote was either partially or completely dry. Following the guideline, we progress into another room. Soon we hit a dead end and have to turn around. This isn't a very highly ornamented cave. There isn't much in the way of speleothems like stalactites and stalagmites. Heading back out through the tunnel, I hang back a ways to get some shots of Jeff and Todd ahead of me. Working our way back towards the cavern, our own removes a section of line he laid on the way in. Then we make our way back up into the sunlit waters of the cavern. Jeff has found a cow bone in the debris pile. It's not hard to imagine an animal wandering through the woods and accidentally falling into this deep pit. Near the bone, the skull, complete with a few remaining teeth. Finally, we surface, and now the hard work is about to begin. To get us back out of the cenote, the guides lower a rope ladder. That ladder's not long enough. We're, we're not sure if this is going to work, but <laughs> hopefully it will, because we're not very good at climbing trees. <laughs> it looks like it will be easy to climb, but I assure you it's not. First, Jeff heads up while Aaron tries to keep it tensioned so it won't flip around sideways. Next, it's my turn. Here we go. By halfway up, my arms are burning from the effort. Then it's cameraman Todd's turn. It's slow going, but eventually we all manage to climb out of the cenote with sore arms to show for it. I gotta... Not all cenotes are small holes with water way down inside. We take a walk through the woods to a cenote so large that it looks more like a lake. And in a small town outside Merida, we check out the town well, which is just a cenote with a tiny opening. 
I would love to dive in there, but they probably don't want a scuba diver in their water supply. Even today, the cenotes allow access to clean, fresh water. But to the Mayans, cenotes were not just sources of water. Cenotes were also believed to be entrances to the underworld and therefore pathways to the gods. In pre-Columbian times, the Maya people ruled Central America. They built staggering cities, which included massive step pyramids as temples to the Maya gods. They performed rituals that they believed would keep the gods happy to ensure their good fortune. The Mayans would often throw offerings into the cenotes to please Chak, the rain god. Sometimes those offerings included human sacrifices. Would it be possible to dive in a cenote used by the Mayans for human sacrifices? That's where we're going. Our team is piling into the truck and driving back out into the bush to visit a very special cenote used by the Mayans for human sacrifices. We arrive at Cenote San Antonio. The opening was enlarged and reinforced at some point to be rectangular, but this tiny opening was once an important place to the Mayans. So important that we had to get a special permit to dive here. Once again, our guides set up some pulleys and rope to get us and our gear in and out of the cenote. It might be hard to believe, but this dive is even more difficult than the last one. There's no room for error. We will only get one shot at this. Our team suits up with only a vague idea of what we're going to see on the other side of that tiny hole in the ground. We start with a meeting to discuss our plan. Because of the way this cenote was formed, it is safer to be lowered into it rather than repel. Aron goes first. Once he gets down there, I can see just how far down that is. I really don't want to climb a rope ladder out of this. As they lower me into the opening and through to the other side, I am swinging in free space as I descend, spinning with the rope. From down on the water, Aron turns on a light so I can see. The room in here is massive. The ceiling is like a dome. You could never climb out. This cenote is a deadly trap for anything that falls or is thrown inside. Soon the guides lower the rest of the team, tanks and cameras one at a time. It's a very slow process. Oh, here comes my baby. <laughs> By the time we start our dive, I've been floating in the water for more than half an hour. I'm curious, though, exactly how they're going to get me out of here. But for the time being, I am ready with a camera, lots of lights, and my natural curiosity. Our own and Jeff lead us below. The sides of the cenote are covered in ancient dripstone formations, formed probably during the last ice age when sea levels were lower and this cenote was at least partially dry. The walls are made of sedimentary rock formed from an ancient seabed. All kinds of shells are stuck in it, including this perfectly formed sea urchin skeleton. As we drop further, I focus my camera on a jawbone. It's the jaw of a horse, which probably fell in here by accident and drowned. Nothing can escape this watery trap. Mm -hmm. 
Near the jaw, I find my first trace of human presence, a broken piece of pottery. I have to get my head around the fact that this is a pre-Columbian artifact more than a thousand years old. Moving away from the walls and out into the middle of the cenote, I find a bone. This is no horse bone. It's a human tibia, the lower leg bone. And near it, the femur. Humans are buried here. Not far away, a ghostly sight. A human skull resting peacefully next to a perfectly intact earthen bowl. At this depth, in fact, there are human remains almost everywhere I turn. Aron directs me to a field of human remains laying out on the sand in plain view. A skull has its jaw sitting nearby. Of course, we don't touch or disturb anything. Not only is this a grave site, it's part of an ongoing archaeological study. We can look, but we definitely cannot touch. Dozens of bodies at the bottom of this cenote, and I have to wonder what was happening here. Were these people sacrificed to the gods? Or were they simply people who died and were buried here? What me about this place is the preservation of the bones, which are at least 1,000 years old. If only these bones could talk, what would they tell us about life in the pre-Columbian Maya culture? Jeff and Aaron direct me to a shelf on the wall at 90 feet. There, resting peacefully, the remains of two people. Did they know each other? Is their proximity a coincidence? How did they get on this shelf? All questions that will likely never be answered. a jaw with molars that have cavities. What can be learned of the ancient Mayans from clues like this? But not everything down here is about death. This cenote has some of the most prolific cave fauna I've ever seen, including many blind cave fish and a species of cave isopod I've never seen before. With the dive coming to an end, we slowly ascend and finally surface in the pitch darkness of the cenote. That was the spookiest dive of my life, and I'm definitely ready to get back to the sunlit world above. Elmer, Felipe, and Carlos have to lift each of us and all of our gear out with a block and tackle. It's hard work, and these guys are stronger than they look. Hi guys! <laughs> Thanks for hoisting me up! <laughs>
Merida, Mexico is not particularly close to the ocean, but a vast network of unexplored cenotes nearby and the rich Mayan history of the area makes it one of the most fascinating dive destinations I've ever visited. Without question, I'll be back to explore more cenotes. Who knows what secrets they hold in their deep blue depths. This time on Blue World, an underwater blast from the past, celebrating Sea Hunt. But first, exploring sea mounts in the Gulf of Mexico. Meet Jonathan Berg, one of the world's top underwater nature cinematographers. Traveling the world on assignment for all the major networks, he is an Emmy Award winning authority on the underwater world. In freshwater or salt, reefs, wrecks, or caves, Jonathan documents the world beneath the waves. Welcome to the Blue World. The Gulf of Mexico. To many people, it conjures images of oil platforms or even oil spills. But this magnificent body of water is so much more than a rich deposit of oil and gas reserves. There is warm, clear water containing lush coral reefs, murky plankton-filled water with giants feeding on the plankton, and virtually everything in between. The Gulf of Mexico is an ocean basin surrounded by the United States, Mexico, and Cuba. Though connected to the Caribbean, it's somewhat isolated. 100 miles off the coast of Texas, there are three seamounts rising up from the depths. Two of them are capped by lush coral reefs. These are the Flower Garden Banks, protected by the United States government since 1992 as a national marine sanctuary. I've been fortunate enough to receive an invitation from the Women Divers Hall of Fame to join their expedition to the Flower Garden Banks. The trip was planned during the week following the full moon in the hopes of observing coral spawning. I board the Fling, a dive boat based in Texas. Captain Bland is at the helm as we set a course for the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. And while the Gulf is infamous for rough seas, today the weather is flat calm. A trio of bottlenose dolphins have joined us on the bow. First stop is at Stetson Bank, the northernmost seamount in the sanctuary. With the mooring line tied, the ladders go down, and it's time to dive. My camera is lowered on a rope. Down. Sort of. My wife Christine is here as camera woman, and together we descend 80 feet to the top of Stetson Bank. Stetson, like the Flower Garden Banks, is a seamount a pinnacle that rises up from deep water like an underwater mountain. The summit of that mountain is shallow enough that we can get there with conventional scuba gear. Stetson is sedimentary rock. Erosion has made the layers of the rock easily observable. Due to cool water temperatures, there is very little coral at Stetson Bank, but the rocks are covered in sponges and algae. The marine life here takes advantage of what they have.
crack hides a sea urchin and an arrow crab. A well-camouflaged scorpion fish hides in plain sight on an algae-tufted rock. A cluster of purple tube sponge is a home for damselfish. Sponge is a meal for a hungry French angelfish. And a frogfish even looks like a sponge to avoid detection. It's in a weird position and hard to film, but this rare beauty is worth the effort. Stetson Bank also attracts big schools of fish looking for food and a place to hide at night. At this depth, we can't stay very long. Soon, it's time to head back to the boat. We ascend up the mooring line, do a safety stop, and then make our way to the ladder at the stern of the boat. Woo! As soon as everyone's out of the water, the crew begins filling tanks and preparing for departure to the flower garden banks. Anchors are destructive to the reef, so we're tying the boat to a permanently attached mooring line. Down on the reef, the mooring line is attached to a steel ring embedded in the reef. There are several mooring sites on the bank, and no anchors are allowed. Before the dive, we get a briefing from Captain Bland. Just pull hand over hand like you've been doing. Then it's time to suit up and check out the coral. The water here is super clear, and I can see the reef 80 feet down. Christine and I fire up our cameras and try to familiarize ourselves with the topography. We will be back down here after dark looking for the coral spawning. The flower garden banks look much different than Stetson Bank. In the winter, the water here is only four degrees Fahrenheit warmer than Stetson, but that's enough to allow dense coral growth. In fact, the bank is jam-packed with coral in density that's rarely seen elsewhere. Star corals and brain corals dominate the landscape. Large barrel sponges complete the topography picture. There are coral overhangs and crevices creating habitats for the type of marine life that thrives on Caribbean reefs. A moray eel watches me with caution. Christmas tree worms extend their delicate gills into the water. Above the reef, schools of silvery baitfish eat plankton At night, they will hide in the reef where they will be stalked by lionfish, beautiful but deadly invasive species that originated in the Indo-Pacific. With no natural predators in the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean, lionfish populations are skyrocketing. Parrotfish are a common sight on all coral reefs. They eat the algae that lives on and in coral. They have hard teeth that can take the abuse of biting at limestone all day. Once the parrotfish gets used to me, I can get pretty close for some nice shots.
but when I look up, I've attracted the attention of a barracuda, and it's circling. This is definitely not normal barracuda behavior. While this fish does look mean, looks can be deceiving. They're almost never aggressive to divers. It It doesn't take long to figure out that I've stumbled into the Barracuda's cleaning station. As soon as I get out of the way, the Barracuda swims up, does its best to hold still, and receives the attention of a cleaner fish in the form of a juvenile Spanish hogfish. The hogfish is searching for parasites on the Barracuda to eat. If it can find any, the hogfish gets fed, and the Barracuda gets rid of an annoying hitchhiker. It's good for everyone. All too soon, once again, it's time to make our way back to the world above. Christine and I do a safety stop just below the boat. Later in the day, as the sun sets, it's getting to be time for the coral to spawn. We can only hope that tonight is the night. When we start seeing eggs at the surface, we know we hit the jackpot. It's time to hit the water. As I descend into the dark ocean, it looks more like outer space. I'm surrounded by constellations of coral spawn. I'm getting worried that we missed the main event. Down on the reef, I frantically search for spawning coral. Fortunately, it doesn't take long to find a coral colony that hasn't spawned yet. Each polyp of this brain coral is incubating a single gamete bundle. It looks like an egg, but brain corals are hermaphrodites. Each bundle contains an egg and sperm together. As the bundles are released and float away, they later separate into eggs and sperm so they can cross-fertilize in the water column. I'm conflicted as I patiently wait for a coral colony to spawn. I have no way of knowing what I'm missing somewhere else on the reef while I focus all my attention here. But this is what I came to see, the miracle of life. The night may be special to the coral, but the parrotfish is trying to get some well-deserved rest. The barracuda has lost interest in getting cleaned, 
and hunkered down for the night. Our timing was good. The coral spawn is about over by the time we need to leave. I'm thrilled to have been a part of the expedition to the Flower Garden Bank's National Marine Sanctuary. The sponge-covered topography of Stetson Bank, with its diverse inhabitants, is an underwater photographer's paradise. And the reef-covered shallows of the Flower Garden Banks are more densely packed than many Caribbean reefs. Seeing the coral spawn was icing on the cake. The Gulf of Mexico is definitely much more than meets the eye. Next on Blue World, celebrating the classic TV show, Sea Hunt. In 1958, Sea Hunt was one of the most popular programs on US television. It starred Lloyd Bridges as Mike Nelson, an ex-Navy diver doing freelance underwater work. His adventures spurred a generation of viewers to learn to dive and appreciate the ocean. Mike Nelson's gear was state of the art in the 1950s. He had his double hose regulator, tiny rubber fins, and no buoyancy compensator. The spirit of Sea Hunt is being kept alive by a group of vintage scuba enthusiasts who restore, maintain, and dive with classic scuba gear from the 1950s. This weekend, I'm attending a special event that happens only once a year, the Sea Hunt Forever Festival at Silver Springs State Park in Florida. Silver Springs is a special place. It's a little piece of unspoiled Florida wilderness, complete with an alligator or two. There are a lot of springs in Florida, but there's a reason why Sea Hunt Forever takes place here. For example, to find sunken treasure or mineral wealth. From 1958 to 1961, Silver Springs was a prime underwater filming location for Sea Hunt. The clear water and calm, controlled conditions made it a perfect place for what was basically an underwater studio. Silver Springs is now a state park, and no scuba diving is allowed. My name's Captain Christopher Staker. I'm going to be your guide here for the next 30 minutes or so. But today is different. Tourists are boarding a glass-bottomed boat for a fisheye view of the spring. Below the boat, crystal clear water and divers. The rain won't spoil this special day. We're here to get wet anyway. Alan Clauda is getting into his vintage gear for a dive in the spring. I feel right at home here with all these double hose regulators. Cameraman Todd and I head for the water to catch the underwater action. My double hose is a modern interpretation of the classics, so I decide to try out some real vintage stuff. Other than the algae we've all kicked up near the entrance, the water in the spring is super clear, and everyone looks like they just jumped into an episode of Sea Hunt. If ever there was a chance for fully grown adults to relive their childhood, this is it. Reenactments are the game of the day. Play knife fights with rubber knives break out every five minutes.
bad guy is hiding. Meanwhile, the good guy has found a treasure chest. vintage fins, I try to keep up with the unfolding action. Victory for the good guy. The reward? A chest full of gold coins. The local fish keep their distance while I look for the next knife fight. Unfortunately, a bad guy has seen me, and he's coming after me with one of those terrible rubber knives. My buddy Lewis Hero saves the day with his extremely dangerous spear gun. Meanwhile, Jerry Lang zips by on his Voight Porta Sub, an extremely rare piece of vintage gear. Joe Musial fires up a magnesium torch. Magnesium burns so hot that water can't extinguish the flame, and the reaction actually releases oxygen from the water needed to support the combustion. Inside the mouth of the cave, the torch provides light and even produces smoke. These magnesium torches were all the rage in the 1950s, but they're quite dangerous and not commonly used anymore. Diving hasn't really changed fundamentally since the 1950s. We have a few new gadgets that make diving safer, but for the most part, it's still a cylinder of compressed air and a regulator that allows one to breathe that air underwater. But at the end of the day, events that keep vintage diving alive are mostly about having fun. And isn't that why we scuba dive? The Sea Hunt Forever Festival is a great tradition that not only keeps history alive, but is just plain fun. This time on Blue World, Jonathan travels to the Turks and Caicos to learn how marine biologists conduct underwater research. But first, sharks that hide from fish. Meet Jonathan Bird one of the world's top underwater nature cinematographers. Traveling the world on assignment for all the major networks, he is an Emmy Award winning authority on the underwater world. In freshwater or salt, reefs, wrecks or caves, Jonathan documents the world beneath the waves. Welcome to the Blue World. The huge, cold, and stormy Atlantic Ocean is known as a very unforgiving place for ships. 
but the waters off the Outer Banks of North Carolina are especially dangerous. These rough waters with hidden shallow shoals have taken thousands of ships over the past several hundred years. Furthermore, during World War II, German submarines patrolled these waters. They snuck up on unarmed merchant ships and torpedoed them in an effort to disrupt American supply lines. In a small area that came to be known as Torpedo Alley, hundreds of ships were lost. Many people were rescued, but thousands were not. Today, we call it the Graveyard of the Atlantic, and many of the shipwrecks are accessible to recreational scuba divers. While there is often great loss of life associated with a sinking ship, life returns to the ship as it slowly becomes the heart of a thriving community of marine life. A shipwreck may attract marine life from miles around because it's the only thing offering shelter and hiding spots on an otherwise featureless seafloor. The wrecks are engulfed in schools of thousands of fish. But the wrecks of the graveyard have also attracted something else. It's 6 a.m. in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, and I'm boarding the dive boat Atlantis. I'm here to explore the shipwrecks of the graveyard and hopefully meet some sharks. My team and I load gear aboard and head out as the sun is rising ahead of us. Captain Bobby Edwards has been leading dive expeditions here for almost 40 years. He knows the waters and has a feel for the wrecks. He knows where the sharks are. It's a two hour run to our destination, the wreck of the spar. When we arrive, I suit up. I can't wait to get down to the wreck and try to find some sharks. Eighty feet down, the spar is sitting upright at a jaunty angle with that classic shipwreck look. The wrecks are far enough offshore that they're bathed in the warm, clear water of the Gulf Stream, which flows like a river from the Caribbean up the east coast of the United States. And as I expected, there's no shortage of fish. Huge schools of Tomtati grunts swarm around the wreck. are chased by jacks, which herd them like sheep while looking for stragglers to pick off. I see a lot of fish action, but no sharks. Inside the wreck, not much is happening at all. There's a toilet with a view.
Without finding any sharks, our team ascends. I have to spend a few minutes doing a decompression stop on the anchor line before I can surface. We decide to try a different wreck, so Captain Bobby moves the boat a short distance to the wreck of the Aeolus. Pretty famous for sharks. Soon I am back in the water and heading to the bottom. Down on the wreck, the fish action is intense. The jacks are chasing not just the grunts, but huge numbers of smaller, silvery fish called scad. It's complete mayhem on the wreck with fish darting every which way trying to avoid the jacks, yet still remain in the safety of schools. Some of the schools are tightly packed around dark objects that are moving through the water. Sharks. might think that the fish would be crazy to hang around a shark, but it's the perfect protection. The scad are too small and maneuverable to be caught by a big shark. As long as they steer clear of the shark's mouth, they're unlikely to become shark food. But the jacks would make a much better lunch for the shark. The scad are using the sharks as bodyguards. Nobody asked the sharks if they wanted to be bodyguards. Doesn't seem like there's much they can do about it, though. But the sharks have figured out how they can hide from the fish. They take turns slipping inside the wreck. Down here the scad seem to relax a bit and they don't cling quite so close to the shark. The shark seems like she's taking a break from all the excitement. As she hovers inside the wreck, the fish mayhem is still taking place outside in the background. But that's not the most unusual thing going on here. This shark is hovering in place with perfect buoyancy control. It's extremely rare to see a shark hovering Bony fish have a swim bladder they can use to adjust their buoyancy so they can hover in place. Sharks have no swim bladder and they sink if they stop swimming. Most sharks either keep swimming all the time to stay up off the bottom 
or settle down to rest now and then. Hovering is just not an option. Sand tigers, however, aren't about to let something like anatomy keep them from hovering. They occasionally rise to the surface and take a big gulp of air, turning their stomach into an improvised swim bladder. Perfect buoyancy. It can't be easy to get it right, but the sharks know just how much air they need to gulp down in order to hover inside a shipwreck 90 feet deep. This shark has a rusty fishing hook stuck in her mouth. Fortunately, the fisherman let her go, but didn't want to go near her teeth to remove the hook. So the line was cut. But the hook will rust away in a few weeks, leaving a rusty stain in her mouth as evidence of the dangers of fishing hooks. The teeth of the sand tiger shark are the ultimate fishing hooks. Long, thin, and wickedly sharp, they resemble a mouthful of needles pointing backwards so nothing can wiggle out. These teeth are superbly designed to catch slippery fish. But they're not cutting teeth. Sand tigers don't take big bites out of large prey. They swallow smaller animals whole. The graveyard of the Atlantic may have begun with the death of hundreds of ships, but new life is springing from these wrecks. As artificial reefs, they provide habitat for fish, invertebrates, and even sharks, helping the ocean recover from decades of overfishing. Every time I visit the wrecks of North Carolina, I'm amazed by the experience and astonished more than ever by the beauty and complexity of the blue world. Jonathan is about to submerge himself in marine biology. It's the middle of the night on the tropical island of South Caicos. A group of marine biology students are wading into a mangrove, helping to tag baby sharks. I'm here to observe to learn some of the ways that marine biologists perform field work for research. I've flown to the sunny but remote island of South Caicos in the Turks and Caicos Islands, just southeast of the Bahamas. Here, the School for Field Studies operates a field research facility where college students from all over the United States come for some hands-on marine biology field work. Faculty at the School for Field Studies have ongoing research projects investigating fisheries management, reef health, shark populations, and even human impact on the marine environment. I'm going to spend some time tagging along with the students to see what they do every day in their pursuit of a degree in marine biology. My day begins with the shark research team led by Professor Aaron Henderson. Henderson and his students are investigating how the marine protected areas around South Caicos are affecting the shark population. Their first task for the day is to deploy some baited camera rigs. These rigs will hopefully attract and film several species of sharks. The goal? To learn how many and what species of sharks are here in the marine protected area. Some of the cameras go near shore, and others are placed in deeper water.
Later, they retrieved the cameras and searched through the footage to see what showed up. Quite a few interesting shark species live around the island. Nurse sharks, Caribbean reef sharks, tiger sharks, lemon sharks, and even great hammerheads have visited the cameras. The team also tags adult sharks, but to do that, they need to get them close to the boat. They use what are known as drum lines. These are baited hooks attached to a float and a weight. They're designed so that sharks can swim around when they're caught so they won't drown. With five drum lines set, the team goes back to the first one and checks for a shark. They check each line every 15 minutes so a shark doesn't stay hooked too long. Oh, there's something, there's something. He's looking straight up at the boat. Okay, let the line out as quick as you can, Alyssa. Soon they have their first shark. Dr. Henderson places a tag on its dorsal fin while the students take a small tissue sample from its tail for an isotope analysis of the shark's diet. While the shark team is out tagging sharks, another team of students is heading out to sea as well. This group is studying the fish population of the island, again trying to determine the effectiveness of marine protected areas. Instead of working from the boat, these students will be doing their research with scuba gear. The divers ready? Right hand on your mask and rag, left hand on any dangly bits. We've got three divers going in in three, two, one, roll. Underwater, they head to a nice section of coral reef and begin a transect. Essentially, they reel out a very long tape measure over the reef, which defines a specific path of a specific length. They wait a few minutes for the fish to go back to their normal routine, then they slowly swim along the transect, taking notes on what species and numbers of fish they see. Of course, they don't see every fish. A lionfish hiding in a hole escaped detection. But this technique yields a pretty good estimate of fish numbers on this section of reef. By comparing the transect results inside and outside of the marine protected areas, the students can learn not only how well the marine protected areas are working, but on which species. Of course, fishing pressure is what affects fish populations, so it makes sense to also find out what species of fish are being caught. The students work with the local fishermen who volunteer to allow the students to come down to the docks at the end of the day and survey their catch. Marine protected areas help to ensure that there will always be enough fish to catch. Another team of students, another research project. This team is working in snorkel depths without scuba, studying a big snail called a conch. The conch is one of the most popular seafoods in the Caribbean, and a whopping 10% of the world's supply comes from the tiny island of South Caicos, so it's an important resource. The conch population seems to be dropping, and the conch research team wants to know why. This transect in the seagrass bed is being used to count conch. They will also collect a few conch for additional research on land. Back at the shore, alongside a representative from the Turks and Caicos Department of Environment and Maritime Affairs, the students crack the conch open in the traditional way. Student Daniel Liu is trying to come up with a way to determine the size of the shell when the shell is gone. It is 44.9. Fishermen often take the meat out of the shell at sea and return with only the meat and no shell. How can the government recommend or enforce size regulations if there's no shell to measure? So Daniel's research is looking at other ways to gauge the maturity of a conch without a shell. Researchers at the School for Field Studies are also looking at the spotted eagle ray. Rare in many places, spotted eagle rays are in high abundance in South Caicos. Intern Connor Burke free dives with a camera on a pole attempting to get close enough to do photo identification of the rays based on their spot patterns. 
the spot patterns are unique to each individual, like fingerprints. He hopes to identify individual animals, learn the social structure of eagle ray aggregations, and figure out if there's a pattern to their movements around the islands. All of this information can be used to help protect the species. As the sun sets and the air cools down, my day following the students isn't over. I have rejoined with the shark team to follow along on their night work. Baby sharks live in the mangroves where they're safe from a lot of larger predators. A couple of nights a week, Okay guys, come on over, let's get the net out there. Dr. Henderson and his students head over to the mangrove areas to catch baby sharks. They start by setting a net in the chest deep water, hoping to snare small sharks as they cruise by. Every 15 minutes, they check the net, and when they have a shark, they bring it back to a makeshift lab on shore, where they will weigh it, tag it with an electronic tag, take a small tissue sample, some ID photos, and then quickly get it back in the water. One of the students will swim the baby shark around for a few minutes to re-oxygenate its gills, and then they send it on its way. From sharks to fish to conch and more sharks, my day with the marine biology students in South Caicos was exhausting but exciting. I saw how marine biology can be conducted from shore, from a boat, and underwater using scuba or snorkeling. Sometimes we imagine marine biologists as having glamorous jobs working with whales or diving with sharks. But marine biology is a broad spectrum of ocean-related studies with specialists in everything from plankton growth to whale rescues and everything in between. Sometimes it's pretty exciting. Sometimes it's not very glamorous. But if you love the ocean and life in the ocean, marine biology is a job that will never be boring. <laughs>